Sebastian, you won't believe what I just bought. Matthias, you won't believe what I just bought. Well, I bought a red Komodo. Hey there underwater filmmakers and welcome back to another video here. It's great to see all your smiling faces and as always a pleasure to welcome Sebastian back here Thank in you. the studio for a very special video. Today as you've heard in the intro Sebastian and myself we treated ourselves to a red Komodo each just a couple of months ago and we want to use this video today to talk a little bit about um, why we upgraded to these cameras, why specifically these cameras, what was missing for us in the cameras that we used previously and what we are hoping to achieve by using these red cameras um, on future projects and generally in our future um, underwater filmmaking stories. So, Sebastian, why did you buy a red Komodo? Or better, let's start the other way. Uh, what did you use before, equipment, setup-wise, and why were you not happy with it anymore? Yeah, I think it's a good way to start because, like, I had a um, Canon 1DX Mark II mm -hmm. in a Nordicam housing uh, with a small HD monitor, um, and I was uh, I was more or less happy with it. It uh, delivered decent footage. I got some lens options and uh, yeah, it was nice. Um, but for me, at a certain point, if you start like doing like more production things or like I was um, involved in a in a video project for music video, mm -hmm. um, then, then the requirement was manual focus just to get to get all this, this stuff in the, in the, in the right uh, um, focus and stuff like that. Yeah. And this wasn't possible. Uh, with the 1DX at that time, um, there were options to to upgrade um, to a specific um, extension for specific uh, kind of lenses, but it was not in general possible. So mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. I was then forced to a specific lens, and then the other problem with the 1DX at that time was um, it was um, a motion JPEG, mm -hmm. um, so the the codec. Um, wasn't optimal okay. optimal for for uh, post production. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, one day eggs. Don't get me wrong. It's not a bad camera at all. And mm. you had a hybrid. Like you could do photos and and videos as well. But like it was not. Yeah, it, it had some flaws. Would would make didn't make me happy. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, fair enough, yeah. Um, as you know, and as probably most of you guys know, I have been using a uh, Panasonic GH5 or GH5S uh, for quite some years now for pretty much all of my content that I've been producing here for the channel as well as for clients and for my you know passion projects and personal work. And I have been happy or had been happy with that camera for a very long time, but it, it did come to a certain point where I started feeling the limitations of the camera. I was very excited when uh, Atomos um, announced that they would um, allow the Ninja V, which was my recorder on the Panasonic GH5S, they were allowing that recorder to record ProRes RAW using the GH5S. Um, and it was great, I really loved shooting in RAW, um, but I found it to be a little difficult to be quite honest. Um, both of these cameras, the GH5 and the GH5S, the S a little better in low light, but still these cameras are not low light beasts by no means. Um, and uh, it took me actually quite a while to learn uh, to work with the ProRes RAW codec. Um, there were other limitations as well, like you said, with the um, manual focus. There is definitely ways how you can manually focus on the GH5S or the GH5 for that matter. Um, but it's all a little more complicated, I found. Um, and um, yeah, it was just all in all, I felt like the time had come for me to upgrade. I also felt like I was ready to take on larger projects to start going into more sort of the commercial work, the, the film industry work. And if you want to um, submit footage to 
um, to clients that use the footage for certain larger projects, oftentimes they will ask you for like proper raw recordings um, and sometimes also from specific camera types because that's the, the camera type that they're using for the rest of the, um, of the project. So that was also one of the motivations that was in the back of my mind when the, the, um, the idea came to upgrade to a new system. Yeah, and, and for me um, as well as like when you're working with a DSLR um, or a, a mirrors like you did, um, for me, it's always like you, you get it to to decent buoyancy, mm. but it's a lot of work involved. So I had to I had a big um, dome port, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. two hundred and thirty um, cent dome port. So I had to drill holes in it to put weights uh, mm -hmm. at the tip of the mm -hmm. the port to get it to get a balance. Because like with a monitor tilted to the back, so they can have a, yeah a decent trim system. It was always like yeah constantly adjusting. Mm -hmm. It was not like uh, it's working. Every time the same, it's like always oh, a little bit, a little bit there, yeah. and it was like a little bit frustrating. And, and I started doing mm -hmm. some stuff, um, three diving, mm -hmm. and um, and there it's like almost impossible to get with that kind of rig uh, in the water and just follow yeah. the free divers. Yeah. Um, you're, not, you're not quick enough, yeah, right? It's not quick enough, yeah. and it's not it's not a compact enough like, yeah. because it's like it's too big. So yeah, and also as soon as you change an element, even the tiniest element, everything just falls apart, and you basically yeah. start from from uh, scratch again, yeah. trying to get the buoyancy trim it, boy, yeah. to trim. Yeah, I've, I've experienced that as well. Also, uh, yours was is the uh, 1DX uh, Mark II is that a full frame camera? Yeah, full it frame, is yeah. right. Yeah, because the GH5S and the GH5 they're both micro four thirds, so I did feel that limit sometimes as well that I would have wanted more depth of field more dynamic range that just wasn't I which just wasn't able to get that from that uh, that smaller sensor really um, yeah and so what did we do we we talked about this for a long time I mean when was the first time we talked about upgrading sometime sort of probably about a year ago or yeah, something was, right yeah Oh, yeah. And then more than a year, yeah, but even more than a, a year. Time, yeah. And then it took month of you know discussing, researching, rediscussing, reevaluating options, looking for the best possible uh, combinations, and all that sort of stuff. And then, um, well, well, why don't you tell tell them how we got to the Komodo? Uh, well, yeah, as you said, we're like always like we're talking about cameras reassessing, and and um, what we figured out very quickly is that there is no perfect solution out mm. there. I mean, Very even true. with the, with the every time, uh, every money uh, in the world, you couldn't get the, the perfect mm. system. It's like, where do you use the system? Okay, and, and which kind of, um, um, which kind of agreement uh, would you, would you, can you make to, mm -hmm. to, to get uh, what you need? And uh, yeah, so we started to looking in different kind of cameras, like smaller ones, which we, uh, as well considered like I don't think it, we talked about a C200 yeah. we talked about a C70 yeah. we even talked about a, um, a V Raptor yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about a Komodo yeah we I talk, don't know, we talked about Blackmagic. We talked um, about a Sony a7S3 we yeah. talked about an R5 from Canon yeah and uh, and yeah and I think for every camera you find one uh, big advantage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you take for example the Sony mm -hmm. said yeah low light the best low light um, Camera yeah. you can get and say yeah. okay fair point, but there are other points which are not Canon cameras autofocus amazing amazing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then the other points where you say yeah And so we started yeah, like <laughs> narrowing it down. Yeah. to uh, eliminating to camera models yeah, to a few cameras and <laughs> Also um, budget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm talking about That's a big budget, one. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise we would have probably Aria sit Alexa, here with yeah. the yeah exactly. <laughs> so uh, budget was also a big issue or a big topic that we had to find a middle ground, a middle way there. Yeah, and, and I think the the decision our um, decision was made f more fluent when we talked about um, the manufacturer we're choosing for the housing. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we are like sticking to one or two more camera models, and then we saw, we we started looking around what kind of options we have um, for the housing uh, and each housing, what kind of limitations it would have mm -hmm. or what kind of monitors, what kind of lenses, mm -hmm. batteries, mm -hmm. accessories, what kind of possibilities would we have? And yeah, yeah so we, we narrowed it, it down actually to two manufacturers mm -hmm. and to two camera models, I think it was. And uh, yeah, so we got to the, 
to the Komodo. To the Komodo, yeah. And I think that's something that I've learned in the past, that it's not when you pick a new camera, um, regardless what the reasons are for choosing a new camera, that you should always be not just looking at the camera as a sole piece of equipment, but always take the housing into consideration as well, because the housing is really what will enable you to use the camera in either a very um, a very complete way or a rather limited way. You can have the best camera for shooting underwater, but if the housing that you put your camera in is not capable of, of giving you access to what you need from the camera, then it doesn't really make any sense to have such a camera in the first place. And so the two uh, manufacturers that we looked at, they were um, Nauticam, which is your no Nauticam, probably the biggest player when it comes to um, underwater camera housings nowadays. And we've also looked at Gate, which is an American-based uh, um, housing manufacturer and they do manufacture manufacture housings specifically for the larger cinema systems. Um, I used to get uh, years ago I used to get a housing from them for my GH5 and they just had to um, sadly say that they don't make any housings for uh, DSLR and mirrorless systems they only produce housings for larger cinema systems because that's their market that's where they found their niche that's what they do very well and fair point they're just sticking to this and they've got their very loyal clientele uh, which just buys their housings for what they are. Um, so we looked at both these housings and um, maybe you can just go quickly over the points that we liked about each of the housings and um, then we'll get into which housing we chose. Yeah, uh, well, we started with looking at Nauticam because like we were used to, to Nauticam and, and had a look at what kind of possibilities we have and, and like, yeah, for the especially for the Komodo, you would have like access to every every camera function, you would have the possibilities um, to have diff a limited but a, um, certain amount of, of lens choices. Mm. And um, But again, then we were not happy with the whole buoyancy system and we couldn't get our hands on um, a Komodo housing for testing, um, just to try it and, and see if it's really like that buoyant, how they uh, advertise it. Um, yeah, and then we had we had a look at uh, at the Gates Komodo housing, and um, well, you have as well every um, every button is functional, and additional to that, they have a special unit called the GCC, um, which is a, a camera control unit. We have we have shortcuts, um, which is. Let me show you. Yeah, because you know, so obviously we do have my housing here available to look at, and if you look at it, this is. It is actually a rather small housing, um, which is thanks to the small factor of the camera itself. It seems big, but compared to what this camera can do underwater, this is a rather small housing. If you look at the yeah, at housings for similar cameras uh, down there, um, and this is on this side over here is the control unit, the GCC over here that Sebastian just mentioned and I'll pass back to you. Uh, yeah, and, and we talked about that and, and it was like, wow, that's amazing. Because like, you don't have to go to the menu to, to I don't know, um, start peeking uh, on and off or, or get a white balance. It's just one button push and, and it's done. Yeah. And it was like, okay, let's look further into it. And then we checked um, the available monitors for it and, and they uh, offer I think it's uh, one of the um, of the Atomos uh, monitors. And the Shinobi. The Shinobi, right? Yeah, the Shinobi. The Shinobi yeah. Yeah. And then a smaller G503 Bright. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this was like, yes, that's one of the best monitors you can get for underwater, um, yeah, for underwater filming because like it's very bright, a lot of functionalities and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's very clear, very good display. Mm. I, I had it in the, I have the, the the previous, uh, previous, right? uh, yeah. Yeah, the previous model in my 1DX and was very, very yeah. uh, happy with it. Yeah. And then as well, we looked at the at the choices we had for um, for focus control and for, for zoom control. We had that there as well. It's a very well manufactured uh, system, which is uh, capable of to yeah, put almost any lens, not almost, actually any lens uh, to manual control and to mm -hmm. aperture or zoom control. Yeah. Um, and the lens choices like they are as well, I would say unlimited, but yeah, we have to talk about certain diameters to get it into the housing. But like, it's not like you buy a dome port for that 
uh, for this lens and, and, and an extension for another one. It's like there you have a whole setting, you just uh, put it together and, and, and test it and then you can use the setup you bought uh, at the beginning for different lenses. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, this was like, okay, that, that is that is amazing. Yeah, so yeah. We have, we have uh, free lens choices and, and, and yeah, and can, can do whatever we want. Exactly, yeah. I think that was one of the big selling points for us to go towards the, the gate housing was that uh, you don't have to get a separate dome port for every single lens that you that you want to use. And especially for traveling, this makes a huge difference because the only thing that we need to do, and I'll grab the housing again to show you, um, is that, if you can see this, I take this off, you have some um, lens extension uh, rings or extension rings here that are mounted in between the camera body or the housing's body and the dome port itself. And depending on what lens you're using and how long it is, you can just add more or take some of these extension rings away and uh, you'll get some really good optical performance from that same dome port with a variety of different lenses. And as I said before, when it comes to traveling, not having to take like four different dome ports with you when you go someplace just because you want to shoot with different focal length underwater this this is an absolute game changer and huge and that was one of the main reasons why we've decided to go for the gates in addition to having that amazing gcc having one of the best or even i would even say the best monitor that you can get for underwater monitoring nowadays uh, at this stage integrated in here and a system that really works pretty flawlessly and has been has been tested uh, by so many people and uh, just works really that's that's what it comes down to it is a system that just works not saying that it is ah, sorry just putting it back down here not saying that it is a easy system to work with by no means right there's still a lot of things that we had to learn when it came to using the Komodo and the Gates housing in combination. Uh, filming with a camera like the Komodo underwater is definitely not the same like using your GoPro or uh, or even another uh, mirrorless or point and shoot camera. But the possibilities, and that's why we got this system, they are endlessly bigger compared to uh, a smaller basic camera. And just talking uh, shortly, uh, briefly about uh, the manufacturer again, one for me personally, uh, one key point for uh, um, choosing gates is the, the amazing customer support. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had so many questions um, about the housing and, and the possibilities and, and the guys at, at gates, they, they took their time. We, we had a, a video call, they explained us everything. We could uh, um, write them emails, ask them specific questions before we bought anything from them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, for me, this was like, okay, this is, if I have, Anytime, any problem, I just can approach them and they will help me. And yeah, and I, that's, I, yeah, and we've tested that already as well, <laughs> because sometimes it can happen that before you buy something, a company will be very supporting because they want to sell you something. And as soon as you bought it, the customer support is nowhere close as good as it used to be before. Yeah. But that's not true with Gates. We've had, I've had little issues where I had something wrongly connected and it didn't work. And uh, I just wrote the uh, the guys at Gates an email and within hours, literally during work days, within hours, they'll respond and they'll have an answer for you, either a solution or a way of getting to the information that you need and helping you. And even if you do need something, that's really cool. Um, if you need something because something broke or you lost something or whatever, they're really quick. Like I've, I've had an issue where I had something was missing in my order and within like two days, I had that missing part in my mailbox. And they're in, in the States and I'm in Switzerland and they shipped it across half of the planet and within like two days. And that's really, really, really good customer support that I really appreciate um, and just sort of, uh, um, confirms that the choice that we've made with Gates was uh, was the right and proper choice. Yeah. yeah. All right, so now that we know uh, what we're using, what we're using with our Komodo, let's talk a little bit more about the Komodo itself and why, why the Komodo in terms of the functionalities that the camera has. What are you really looking forward to using and making into use with the Komodo? Um, well, there for me, uh, like three three main parts. Um, 
the first part is the form factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this little thing is capable of uh, of producing amazing pictures, and uh, it's just that tiny. I mean, it's yeah. very very small, and so it gives us the opportunity to have a travel friendly, uh, free diving friendly, and a, a quick action friendly housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is yeah, this is perfect for for under for an underwater um, video housing. Um, then the second point, red raw. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean the, the possibilities you have with that kind of, of footage is amazing, especially in, in, an, in an underwater environment um, where you have um, like different colors, yeah. uh, difficult uh, um, lighting scenes and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you can really work with that uh, dynamic range mm -hmm. and with that possibility Red Raw is, is, is offering you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm going to include a little clip in here, uh, an example clip that we've shot um, on our first trip using our RETS, which was uh, in uh, Bonaire um, a few months ago. And uh, it was on the very first dive. We didn't really have a clue what to do with the camera and how to use it. And I think we had so many settings set to the wrong thing in camera. And if you look at the clip, the image of me, then it looks like, oh my God. And when I looked at it first, as it came out of camera, I was like, I can never use this image. And then I started playing around and using Red Raw and trying to form the image. And it's not a perfect image by no means, but it just shows you how much you can actually do with that codec. And even if you've got everything set to the wrong setting, it's very likely you'll still be able to recover the, uh, the footage and make it work to a certain degree. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be usable in most projects. And that's huge because oftentimes underwater you have to react quickly and time is a factor and you don't have time to reset all your settings from one shot to the other. Being able to use a shot, even if it's not perfectly white balanced, perfectly lit, that's big. That's really big. It, it helps a lot. Yeah. And, and uh, even if, if you have to, to react quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Third point, why we choose the Red Komodo? Well, the third point is, as I mentioned before already briefly, that we do really want to get into sort of the higher end productions with our underwater work. Um, and we know that being able to get easier access there, you need to have stronger codecs. Like Red Raw is pretty much one of the strongest codecs that you can get in any camera. Um, being able to supply footage in, in that quality is just going to open doors. I know that's going to happen, already has happened actually. Uh, we'll announce uh, the news as soon as it's all official. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that uh, will help. Also, I think that I've been using my underwater imagery quite a lot to uh, sell shots um, online on stock footage agencies. And I'm pretty sure that I can just ask for a higher price if the clip has been filmed in Red Raw and I can supply the agency that's going to be working and buying the clip and working with it if I can supply them with the original Red Raw file and they can really bend it so it looks the way they want for their project. Um, that, uh, that's definitely another part, another reasoning there. Yeah, just just the image quality itself is is like is amazing from a red camera. Um, even in, in that tiny form factor is, is amazing. Yeah. Like not, yeah. You know, and, and I'm not talking about sharpness and stuff like that. It's just like the overall look and feel of the image is is very very appealing. Mm -hmm. Looks very natural. Very natural. Not not, di not uh, any digital. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 very nice. I love it. Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. Exactly. So, is everything good now? Have we gotten the perfect <laughs> setup for the next couple of years? Not at all. <laughs> Well, as I said at the beginning, um, there is no perfect, uh, perfect setup, and there is not a perfect camera or the perfect housing. So, um, but for us, it is a very, very, very good solution. Um, it works perfectly for us, <laughs> um, as long as we work perfectly with it. Exactly, and that's that's the point. What we learned uh, that we have to learn a lot, actually. Um, it's like we're starting from zero. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah starting from getting everything together, how everything works, um, getting used to a new camera, to a new yeah. underwater housing, and then uh, post-production. Yeah, yeah. We're not, we, we're not working with a, with a uh, um, 
um, like pro progress um, codec or something, you're working with red raw files and you have to know how to handle them. And mm -hmm. we're still in the process of learning that. Um, it's amazing what you can do, as Matthias yeah. said. But yeah, you have to put uh, in some work um, to get the results you want to have at the absolutely. end. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing why we are oh, well, but this it's not specific to this camera, we would have done this with any other camera as well, but we did get two of the same kind. So we got two red commodos and we got two Gates housings, just for the reason as well that we can work together on larger projects and we have twice the same setup. So the imagery is gonna be interchangeable without any troubles of uh, making sure that they fit within, within each another. And this has been a problem in the past where you were filming with your 1DX and I was filming with my GH5 yeah. and the imagery that came out of these cameras natively just looked so different that it took a long time. Sometimes it was even not possible at all to make them yeah. make them match completely and seamlessly go seamlessly into each another. Yeah. So this is uh, it's going to be much, much easier now with the two same setups that we've got. And also here in Switzerland, no one else is capable of supplying you with a um, complete setup for a red Komodo to film underwater. I don't think even a any red camera. They don't is any. There, there isn't any for um, underwater. I don't for underwater well. Yeah, for underwater. Um, and this is kind of a uh, sort of a unique selling point for us uh, when it comes to selling our services as underwater filmmakers and cameramen um, here in Switzerland. If you are in Switzerland and by any means need someone to record your underwater uh, scenes in red, raw, highest quality imagery, you know now who to call. Um, but yeah, I think that pretty much sums up uh, our, uh, our sort of discussion and our uh, exchange of thoughts with you guys uh, to the or about the process of uh, us upgrading from our existing systems to our new little darlings here and the, the um, gates housings and uh, yeah if you do have any questions regarding that please feel free to put them down in the comment section below we're more than happy to get back to you as quickly as we can and answer all your questions there also uh, let us know if you're in the process of upgrading your camera uh, underwater camera system and what you're shooting with now, what you're thinking of upgrading or what you have just upgraded recently to and the reasons behind the choices that you made or are about to make. I'm done. Okay, <laughs> so thank you guys for watching. If you liked the video, hit that like button and um, like buddy, that like, like button, button. <laughs> and uh, consider subscribing to our channel. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you next time. And uh, take yeah. care. Happy bubbles. Enjoy capturing your underwater adventures. Stay safe and healthy and we will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.